our wars abroad and our wars at home. This week on the show, acclaimed graphic artist Molly Crabapple and Syrian journalist Marwan Hisham join me to talk about their collaborative book, Brothers of the Gun. Then, a report by Jonathan Klett on a community in Wisconsin that mobilized to greet the Republicans attending a Trump fundraiser. Voces de la Frontera. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. At the heart of the memoir by one of today's guests is a question. Will I be excused from blame or am I just another monster? Living in the city of Raqqa, Marwan Hisham, a Syrian journalist who came of age during the Arab Spring, finds himself at one and the same time reporting on ISIS and the other militia group members who are waging the Syrian civil war and serving them tea, an internet service at a cafe where he works. His book, a collaboration with the artist Molly Crabapple, who was last on this show with her memoir, Drawing Blood, places readers at the intimate center of a deadly catastrophe we know too little about in this country. But it raises a question that isn't his alone. Survivors, observers, aren't we too asking ourselves, will we be excused? Aren't we, too, also, in many ways, enablers of war, even as we're horrified by it? And what role does art play in helping us all grapple with this dilemma? Brothers of the Gun, a memoir of the Syrian war, written by Hisham and illustrated by Crabapple, is out now from One World Books. Hisham, not his real name, but the name he goes by, is joining via Skype from where he now lives in Turkey. Marwan, Molly, great to have you back. Thank I you. feel like we have a little connection with this book because as I remember it, Molly, you were leaving to talk with Marwan right after we last spoke about, about your last book. What happened? At that time, uh, me and Marwan were sort of in the middle of our collaboration and he was uh, still uh, living in Raqqa at that time and working as a journalist who's doing stuff for the New York Times and foreign policy. And as you know, uh, to work as a journalist in Raqqa was something of profound bravery. Uh, Syrian journalists were routinely murdered by ISIS as spies. And right before I went on air with you, um, that was when all of the internet cafes were closed in Raqqa. And I didn't know when I was going to hear from Marwan again. So it's such an honor that like I come back here and we've done this whole book together. It's beautiful. Marwan, tell us a little bit about where we are speaking to you now and, and why you're now living in Turkey. So uh, at some level, it was uh, impossible to stay in Iraq and I said because uh, especially in 2016, they get uh, really um, paranoid and uh, yeah, it became extremely uh, risky to, to stay there, so um, I had no other option but to leave and come to Turkey. And the reason I stayed in Turkey is that I didn't want to stay away from the country and the war. I wanted to, you know, do more. I wanted to go back uh, uh, one day and uh, see you know, everything, basically. I wanted to witness this war from, you know, from the beginning to the end. So that's why I, I decided to stay in Turkey and not uh, go to Europe, like most of, uh, uh, or, or many Syrians uh, here in Turkey. Well, Marwan and you with Marwan have, have already seen a lot of this war. It's not over and it feels like many wars. Um, but at the heart of this book is the story of the brothers, of... of, of three men coming up in the same period and dividing in different ways. Can you just sort of lay out for people who haven't gotten themselves a copy of the book yet what's in it? The book is, uh, is Marwan's story and also the story of uh, two brothers, Tarek and Nael. Nael, before the revolution, uh, was a working class guy who was able to get into the best art school in the country and wanted to be wanted to be a visual artist. But when he was arrested, 
at an anti-regime protest and when he witnessed uh, the security forces brutally torturing and religiously humiliating people, he decided that a peaceful protest alone wouldn't work against the regime, that the regime was too brutal, and he uh, joined the armed resistance to the government and died fighting against the government. His brother Tarek was at this point in Beirut where he was studying Arabic literature and writing poetry and he had a cool motorcycle. He was living a life that like any young guy would have wanted. But he was so affected by his brother's death that he decided to come back to Syria and to also uh, join a rebel group in order to uh, avenge his brother's death. And he ended up joining an Islamist rebel group called Ahrar Sham. The cover is a picture of Tarek. Um, Marwan, can you tell us a little bit about that picture and then we'll hear how Molly created the beautiful image that she did? So the picture uh, was taken from Tarek's uh, social media. Uh, basically, uh, in, in his uh, last days, um, when he was in Aleppo after long journey with lots of uh, uh, battles, defeats after defeats, um, he ended up in uh, Aleppo countryside, and uh, uh, he had lots of time to. Uh, he wasn't at the front at that time. Uh, most of his time in Aleppo, he was uh, basically doing uh, uh, more like administrative job and special missions and uh, uh, so he had lots of time to think about everything and uh, he towards the uh, the end he, he changed and uh, this reflects his uh, uh, yeah. and his uh, uh, he, he was uh, uh, an Arabic literature uh, graduate and he used to write poetry and post it on, uh, on his Facebook. So uh, at some level, he was really nostalgic about uh, the, the normal life, about perhaps the old days. And uh, um, although his AK at that time was his uh, companion, his uh, uh, companion throughout all the journey, but yeah, I can see in it uh, how he earns to uh, to go. We're going to call Marwan back to get a better line. But yeah. this cover conveys so beautifully the the what you brought to this collaborative project in the sense that you are working off a photograph but you are capturing the essence that goes way beyond this individual. Talk a little bit while we call Marwan back about how this process worked and what your goals were in, with the illustrations, which are way more than illustrations, really. Thank, thank you so much. So the cover image of Tarek is actually pretty unusual in the book because most of the photos that I drew directly from were photos that Marwan took himself, uh, photos he took in Raqqa, in Mosul under the ISIS occupation, and also in rebel-held East Aleppo. So he was out there secretly taking these pictures exactly. at tremendous risk to his yeah. life. Exactly, exactly. He took these pictures at immense risk, but it's because he's such an incredibly brave journalist and because he believes in the power of art to convey something that other mediums perhaps cannot. But then other images, uh, we were trying to do images that Marwan couldn't have taken photos of, right? Like when he was, you know, a boy in religious school or images of protests perhaps. Uh, and so for stuff like that, I, I relied in part on the huge wealth of citizen video that there is about the Syrian war. Uh, for the images of protests, I might take a um, hundred screenshots, perhaps, of several videos of the same protests, and I would print them all out, and I would lay them out, and then sometimes I would even repose models in the positions because the the images were so blurry that the people just looked like smudges, you know, when it was screenshot. But then other images, I, I relied on Marwan's memory, and, and I believe that each of these drawings, they're both of ours. They're not just mine. Uh, Marwan art directed this book. He would uh, do rough sketches. He would sometimes even pose. He would describe in the most uh, accurate and meticulous way what he wanted. And he is lethal to cliches. <laughs> if he saw something that was like a Western cliche, he was like red pen of death. No, no, no. <laughs> and maybe it's too much to ask an artist, what do you want your work to achieve? But is it fair to say that 
I feel that what your work is asking me to do is put myself in this picture or at least relate on a very intimate level with the people, not just the destruction. Is, exactly. Is that, a good, is, that a, is that the right response? I, th I, think, <laughs> I think that's a perfect response. I mean, you know, people from the Middle East and, and Syrians, um, particularly, they're so dehumanized in the West, right? Uh, for a conservative, they're the terrorist boogeyman, but even for a lot of liberals, they're just like a pitiful refugee that you want to give charity to. And, and these are such like degrading, undignified roles, right? And so me and Marwan, we wanted to portray Syrians with all of the depth and interiority and nuance that um, anyone deserves. And we also wanted to portray the complexity of the war because a lot of times here, it's seen as like a secular, if very brutal dictator versus ISIS and that in no way captures um, the intense complexity of, of what's going on and also the harrowing choices that people are forced to make inside the war. And one thing that me and Marwan often talk about is that the first step to making state crimes okay is the dehumanization of the people that are the victims. And so in some ways, I hope that this is a, a blow against that. Marwan, we've got you back. To illustrate this complexity and the, and the situation that you're in, um, can you talk about that am I a monster, just another monster moment um, when the women come into your uncle's cafe? Um, can you just describe or, or go back to that moment for our viewers and talk a little bit about that experience? So that particular moment, uh, when I went uh, to and started working at the cafe, um, I had uh, the, um, I wanted to know about the, those people and meet them and interact with them. But uh, I stayed there for two to three months and uh, it became part of my everyday life. Uh, I was in daily contact with those people and uh, met lots of them. Uh, At this point, and, you're talking uh, ISIS fighters I mostly. I, I barely was able to catch up with, with, with the news. Uh, but then I started to uh, basically hear about the uh, Yazidi uh, 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 suffering and the the massacre that were committed by ISIS from the internet. And uh, uh, I didn't know exactly how, how, how it meant for those uh, enslaved women, those captured women, until this scene shocked me uh, when the, those women came with other ISIS women. And uh, I looked at their eyes and uh, I saw something that is really uh, unbelievable, so tragic. And so uh, it, uh, it shocked me. It, uh, I, I immediately felt guilty as if I'm, um, as not just as someone who is in that cafe, uh, who maybe they looked at me as, you know, one of them. Uh, but, but also just being uh, in their territory, just being also as a uh, Sunni Arab, uh, um, I felt guilty for, for this, but uh, uh, there was nothing uh, I could do, nothing most of the people could do. We, we were basically just trying to survive. But then you see uh, what happened to those, uh, uh, to, to uh, this community, and uh, you can't uh, you can't help but feel that um, the that the whole the whole situation, the whole war here, how how, how we got uh, up to this point. So even participating in the protest would felt like wrong at that, uh, at that specific point. Yeah. So let me ask you, Molly, is it, is it shedding differences? Is it cheap to say, to make this about us as well and say, but we're also in a similar quandary? I don't think it's cheap. I mean, I think questions of complicity, uh, questions of what's the moral thing to do and what's not the moral thing to do in some ways are um, even sharper here because we have so much more luxury. We we don't get tortured. Well, some people get tortured if they protest, but a much smaller amount of people will get, this will happen to. Uh, there are not police firing live ammunition at protests generally here. And I, I often uh, think of 
our complicity around issues like, like mass incarceration, issues around the fact that it's police routinely murder black people in this country. And U.S. forces have sort of obliterated, not sort of, have obliterated Raqqa in the name of trying to save it or... Exactly. It. U.S. And I'm not sure if you saw, but uh, an amazing website called Air Wars, which uh, meticulously documents uh, civilian casualties. The U.S. killed uh, 9,600 civilians at least in Raqqa and Mosul in their battle against ISIS, uh, US, the U.S.-led coalition forces, I should say. Yeah. They destroyed the vast majority of Raqqa. In our book, uh, we have an illustration that's from video that Marwan shot, which is perhaps one of the first uh, civilian casualties in Raqqa. Um, a young man named Ismail, who was working at a as, who was working as a security guard at a factory, and yes, the U.S. the U.S. completely obliterated uh, vast swaths of Marwan city, and in fact, Marwan was the first person to break the news of the U.S. airstrikes. And we sit with that, but most often we don't actually sit with that. It just kind of happens in the background. Um, Marwan, if you had a goal for this book, specifically for U.S. audiences and maybe the kind of people that are, are watching this show today, well-meaning, intelligent, deep-thinking, forward-thinking people, um, what's your message to us? How can we help bring this situation to a some kind of peaceful resolution? Well, I think uh, pressure... Uh on the um, American government is always uh, uh, necessary because any change in their policy, I mean, America can help so much in this regard, although it's also part of the problem. All of these countries that are involved in Syria, uh, all of them uh, have inflicted damage in the whole country and they were uh, a reason for its destruction. But also, they hold the key for uh, any solution. And uh, America, in my opinion, has the, uh, uh, is uh, obligated to rebuild Raqqa because they destroyed it. And not just Raqqa, all of these mm. uh, cities and towns, they've uh, bombed uh, relentlessly. And uh, most of them now are. Uh, are, are ruins. So the obligation Modern. to rebuild what we've helped to destroy, but we're not, we have a rotten track record at that. We do, but... Uh, no, go ahead. But, but also, I mean, Raqqa right now is a ruin. There are 6,000 reports of civilian... Or we don't know. There's 6,000 reports of bodies rotting in buildings that we destroyed. We're not even giving money for demining. And, um, you know, a lot of this stuff, it's not like American forces need to go do it. There's plenty of competent yeah. people in Raqqa that can do that. It's just that America isn't giving trucks. It's not giving demining equipment. It's not giving money. And I, I do think that when you level a city, you do have to do that. You can't just destroy a city and leave it littered with rotting human remains and rubble and people living in those ruins and then just wipe your hands of it because you don't want to spend money, which is essentially what's happening. I feel like leaving this interview right there, not coming to some tidy, good-feeling conclusion. Um, your book is beautiful and very stirring, and the stories in it are intimate and put us right in the center of it, us, the reader. Uh, and I just want to thank you and really encourage people to pick up this book and think about their quandaries apropos of this war, these series of wars. And hope that we get to talk to you both again soon. Molly, Marwan, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. My children know that he's in jail, that he is in jail because he was born in a different country, in Argentina. My kids know that he, the police took him because of that. These kids that are six and five, they don't understand. He's 29 now. We moved here when he was 13, so his whole life, almost two decades. I can't lose my brother. His children can't lose their father. Whatever's happening at the border is horrible, is horrible. And it's also happening here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin.
we wanted to disrupt because it's not business as usual. When you have kids that are being um, damaged, uh, tortured uh, by this official policy, and uh, they really haven't taken their foot off the gas, a little bit because of pressure, but they really haven't. The politics of Walker and Ryan and Trump are all cut from the same cloth. And we stand together to say you're not going to divide us against one another. Si se puede. I have so much respect for the youth leaders that we have. So there's a lot of love in that movement, a lot of sacrifice and a lot of bravery. I get energy from that and that keeps me going. I'm an undocumented and a DACA recipient from Mexico City. Just graduated high school in Racing, Wisconsin. Every day, our kids and our families don't know what to do, are living in fear. As the community of Wisconsin, and Milwaukee especially, we are here to make sure Trump listens. Stop separating families. Kids do not belong in cages. from Milwaukee, Sheboygan, Waukesha, Racine. We're here in solidarity for all our people in the struggle. No Trump! No KKK! No fascist USA! No Trump! No KKK! No fascist USA! I think it's astonishing how they forget that they were immigrants at one point too. America is already great with all the immigrants and all the cultures that we have in this country, all the languages that we speak, but that's something that he can't understand. <laughs> As you can see, we have a lot of police behind us. Um, I'm not sure what they're planning to do. We haven't been issued a warning or anything yet, so it seems as if they're almost compliant with it. No matter their race, religion, or creed, we are here for everyone, and that's a statement for all of my people. I just graduated from Harlick High School, and uh, I'm a rebel, I guess you could say. We might be relocating, I'm not sure. Just to you know, see, see what we can do. No border, no nation. Being part of a family, being part of an immigrant community, I want to represent my community. I want to be the voice to all of those children that are in suffering. I want to be the voice to all of those families that are in pain. Tell Trump, stop acting like the hero because you are not the hero. You are the villain in this story. We want action. We don't want words. This is our people. Yeah. So let's hear what real values is. What really makes America great. Let's give a warm hand to Isabel. Yeah. Imagine a seven-year-old on the phone was her dad saying he was picked up by ICE and was not coming home. I was that little girl. My life was shattered that day. It has been almost six years since I felt my father's arms around me. I thank you. You know, my kids, he's their rock. Half of their emotional support system and love has just been torn away from them. When we go to visit him, they take the phone. My son was trying to bang on the glass, try to break the glass so then he could just give his father a hug. I will do anything for my children and we're just gonna keep fighting until my kids get what they need, which is their father. My kids, his children, are heartbroken and I am here speaking on his behalf to demand the immediate release of Franco Ferreira. We fight every day, and we're gonna keep fighting every day. To Donald Trump and all of his wealthy benefactors, shame on them, shame on them, shame, shame, shame. shame. What a disgrace. What a 
disgrace to pay money to listen to a modern day dictator, a wannabe dictator. But we're not going to let him, right? No. Are we going to let him? No. no. And that's what we're here to say today. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. This is the least. No peace. And this is the least we could do for the human rights tragedy that is unfolding in the border and in our community. It is a disgrace. Trump is trying to fuel the flames of modern day fascism in this country. Are we gonna let him do that? No! Are we gonna let him build modern day internment camps? No! Are we gonna let him separate families? No! That's right. He's a brat.